want you to notice in verse number 7 a phrase at his statement here that says, be, Only be thou strong and very courageous. Watch the next statement. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. Look down in verse number 8. And he says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And watch the next statement. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now, Moses, I, uh, Joshua, I want you to understand something. I want you to do according to all the law. I want you to do according to all that is written therein. That little word all there is a very important word. When I was pastoring, I used to tell my people little words are important. All have sinned. That's a very important word, all. Okay? Here he says, I want you to keep all the commandments. Now, go to Matthew chapter 7 with me. Can I tell you for every Old Testament doctrine, uh, there is a New Testament, uh, for every Old Testament uh, principle, there's a New Testament equ equal. It, it, God has that. For instance, if you keep my commandments, I'll bless you. If you don't keep my commandments, I'll curse you. Where's the New Testament? Galatians 6, 7, 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sow to the flesh, he shall the flesh reap corruption. If he sow the spirit, he shall the spirit reap life everlasting. You see, God is a God that has not changed. Now, we're living in a day and age where we've changed God. And we have a God that is not really the God of the Bible. It's a God that's been manufactured by our own personal opinions. Amen. Now, look at Matthew chapter 5. Our Savior is, pre is teaching here on the Sermon on the Mount. He's gone through the Beatitudes. He's also gone through the fact that you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Don't hide your light. He says, let your light so shine before men that we see your good works, see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, in verse number 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Look at that. Think not I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And he says, I didn't come here to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, part of what he fulfilled was the typologies or the prophecies of his coming to save us. Amen. And, and, that's, and, that, and he's talking about fulfilling that. But now notice what he says in verse 19. Whosoever therefore, whosoever, important word, whosoever, any of us, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. Now he said to Joshua, I want you to observe to do according to all that is written therein. All the law. Joshua, I'm expecting you to do all of it. Not just a portion of it. Not just a part of it, not just a part that you like, but I'm commanding you to keep all of it so you can prosper. He now says to the New Testament, to his believers, to his disciples, those who had believed him and gotten saved, he's teaching them. He says, whosoever, there shall, uh, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about lost people going to hell here. He's talking about the saved. He said, if you're a saved person and you break one of these least commandments and you teach others to, you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm, a, I'm just a literal Bible interpreter. I believe if the Bible makes sense, we don't look for any other sense. And I believe here's what he's saying is, is when you get to heaven, if you broke the least of these commandments and you taught somebody else to do it, you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. How would you like to go through all through eternity be calling least? There's least. There goes Least. Hey, I'm not trying to be mean today. I'm trying to tell you something, dear friend. I'm trying to tell you that the devil has sold many of us Christians a wooden nickel. He has sold us a lie. He has tried to make us, under, he's tried to make us believe that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that somehow there are no expectations in the Christian life. Look what he goes on to say. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. God tells Joshua, I want you to do according to all, all, all emphasizing that little word all. Not some, but all. Not a percentage, not a portion, not a minimum, all. Joshua, I'm challenging you to get in the book of the law. I'm challenging you to read it and study it and meditate upon it. And then I am challenging you to keep every commandment I gave you. Jesus then talks about the least commandment. Some of us think there are some commandments, that they're the least commandments. They're the least, and we're not really that important. But God says, Jesus said, if you break one of those least commandments and you teach somebody else to do it, I'm going to call you least in the kingdom of God. Amen. 
Amen. It is wrong for us to throw things in the trash that God didn't throw in the trash. It's wrong for us to have a position that does not line up with God's Word. Amen. Amen. What, and, 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 and in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says there, Think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. What did Jesus fulfill of the law and the prophets? Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8 with me. What is it that Jesus fulfilled? What law was it that Jesus removed? Well, uh, what Jesus removed was the salvation part of the law. That's what he removed. When he, when he came, he became as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And what he removed was not the moral law and not the religious responsibility. He removed the sacrifices, but for the church, he gave us some more responsibilities. Amen. Amen. Now look at Romans chapter 8 with me, and I'll show you what, it, what, 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 law, he, what law he fulfilled. There is therefore now no condemnation them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Watch verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the what? Law of sin and death. He says, here's what I did. I came and I fulfilled the law. The law I fulfilled was this, that the law of sin and death. Here's the law he fulfilled, that sin is going to send you to hell. Amen. But the law of life, spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed me from that law. What he did was he removed uh, this idea, uh, this, he removed this, that, this thought that you could get to heaven by righteousness. Can I tell you that nobody ever got saved by working or keeping the law? Can I tell you that the law was given so that we would know we were sinners? And because we couldn't keep the law, it convicted us we're sinners. And the law was fulfilled when Christ came to remove the law of sin and death. Amen. Look what it says in verse number 3. For, the, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in, in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Keeping the law for salvation was clearly never possible. I was raised believing, I was taught, by an independent Baptist denomination that the Old Testament people got saved by keeping the law. That was not true. And the law Jesus fulfilled was the law of condemnation. He came and he fulfilled this matter of being saved from the law, keeping the law. But he didn't save us from keeping the law morally. Amen. How do you know, Brother Houston? Well, I'll get to it in a moment, but Jesus' purpose for coming to earth, living sinless, dying, and rising again was to fulfill the deliverance of mankind from the law of sin and death. F clearly, He fulfilled the salvation process of a lamb sacrifice for our sins and all the typologies of the Old Testament law. However, the moral law, in internal purity and external behavior and religious responsibility has not been removed. Go with me now and look at verses 20, Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 48. Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 48. After he says, I came to fulfill the law, if you don't keep, the, if you break the least commandment and teach others to break it, uh, you'll be called least and be called great. Then look what he says in verse number 20. For, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, is he teaching work salvation here? He is not teaching work salvation here. You and I can never be as righteous as we need to be saved. So the righteousness comes from Christ. Amen. Amen. But wait a minute now. We're not done. Now look at verse 21. Ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. But whosoever say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Now Jesus said uh, the righteousness uh, that, 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 uh, that the Pharisees has is not even close. And your righteousness has to exceed them to go to heaven, so you're going to have to have my righteousness. But then he goes on to say, now I want you to understand something, though. The law has not been removed. I didn't come to destroy the law. It's still there. Not only is it still there, but I'm going to, stay, I'm going to step it up a notch. I'm going to say to you that the, that the Pharisees believe because they keep the letter of the law that they are righteous. But I'm going to tell you something. The law is far more than the letter. And the law goes beyond just thou shalt not kill. 
thou just shalt not commit adultery. But he says, if you look on a woman to lust, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, amen? He says, thou shalt not kill. But I say, if you have anger in your heart with your brother, you're already guilty of murder. And all of the law, Jesus reiterated that it's still, we're still responsible to keep it. And he said, but I want you to know something. I want, it's not just you keep the law, but it needs to be also a matter of taking that and letting it become an internal uh, part of you. Amen. Look what he goes on to say. Verse, look at verse number, uh, verse number um, verse 22, 27. Ye have heard it said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I send you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, in, 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 after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Look, it says in verse 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing divorce. But I send you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is divorced committeth adultery. Verse 33, again, you have heard of them old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but, but shalt for, perform all thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, nor if, for it is God's throne. Look what he goes down to say in, in uh, verse number 38, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Uh, look down to verse number, uh, uh, verse number 43, ye have heard that it hath been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Of course, that's not what the Bible says, amen? But I say unto thee, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Look what he goes on to say, now, and, then, and look at verse number 48. Be ye therefore, what? Perfect. And nowhere is he teaching that you and I have the right to break his commandments. That you and I can pick and choose what we want to do. Amen. Amen. Whosoever, therefore, in verse 19 of that passage again says, that he gives us here, he expounds upon us the seriousness and the scope of the law. And we're living today where we believe that the liberty that we have in Christ is the liberty to do what we want to do. The liberty to choose and pick. But you have a right to choose and pick. Listen, if it's in the Word of God one time, it is a command of God. Every word of God is inspired. Every word of God is pure. And if it's in the Bible one time, it is God's doctrine or teaching. He doesn't have to say it a hundred times. If it's in there once, it's a part of the inspired word of God. Amen. And so if I break that commandment, I teach others to break that commandment, he says when you get to heaven, you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to keep all the commandments. I, I came to deliver you from the law of sin and death, but now that you're saved, I want you to keep all of my commandments, not picking and choosing. As humans, God has created us with a free will. Amen? We have been given the freedom to choose. We can choose to observe, to do according to all that is written in the Bible, or we can choose to not do according to all that's written in the Bible. We can choose to keep the least commandment or we can choose not to keep the least commandment. We have that power of choice. We can choose to do that. And then we note that Jesus added two very important, interesting statements. You shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. You shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Not only has God given us free choice, but God is a God of authority. God is also, this means he requires responsibility. God requires of us responsibility or obedience. Listen, how can God judge me if I am not responsible? And so God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the command. I'm going to teach you what to do. Now I'm going to let you choose. Now because you choose, you are now responsible. If I didn't give you choice, then I couldn't make you responsible. But I give you choice. Now because you choose, I make you responsible. And not only is he a God that re re requires responsibility, but he's a God that, re that administers accountability. Not only does he require that we keep his commandments, but he says, now one of these days you are going to come to heaven, one of these days you are going to stand before me, and I am going to hold you accountable for your actions. Amen. We must all appear for the judgment of Christ, that we re may receive for the things which we have done in our bodies according to that which you have done, whether it be good or evil. Accountability. You know, listen, if you, if you want responsibility, you have to accept accountability. 
Amen. And we all want to do our own thing. We want to make our choice. We all want to be in control, and we are in control. But you need to understand something, that we are going to be responsible. We're going to be accountable for that. Amen. And he says now, here he gives us, gives us this teaching that if you break one of these least commandments and you teach others to do it, then when you get to heaven, don't expect to be considered great. Don't expect to walk around heaven with your thumbs in here and say, look at what a great Christian I am. He says, that's not what you're going to be. Now, I don't know he's really going to go around calling us least, amen. I just kind of use that to kind of wake people up. But I think he's saying, when you get to heaven, there are going to be degrees of greatness and degrees of leastness. And that's not going to be based on the fact you're saved. It's going to be based on the fact what you do with my commandments. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to challenge us. I, I tell you, I, I, I see this over and over. I travel around the country, and I see that independent Baptists today have decided that we have a smorgasbord religion. I pick what I like, and I don't take what I don't like. Now, I choose this because it's pleasant to me, and I'll do that, but I, this one I don't like, so I'm not going to do it because I don't enjoy it. But that's not the way you, Christianity is, folks. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just teaching the principle God gave me. It wasn't what I wanted to preach. I woke up this morning, something else on my heart, and God made me put this sermon. I've never preached this before in my life. Amen. I love to preach ones already had. I got some great mercy, uh, messages on how wonderful it is to be a Christian. Amen. But God said to me, you need to do this. We can choose to disobey, but we can't choose to avoid the consequences. And we need to learn that. The quicker we learn that, the more we'll receive the blessing that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, and then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. God says, I want you to be prosperous. God says, I want to bless you, but I can't bless you if you don't keep my commandments. I'll bless you if you keep my commandments. Church, if you don't keep my commandments. Proverbs, uh, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand the way of the sinners, nor sitteth the seed of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not, shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. It's a principle that's always been in the book. Amen. And you and I can make all kinds of excuses. We can justify everything we can. But the truth of the matter is, when we get to heaven, God's going to say, hey, that was wrong. You broke my commandment. And by breaking my commandment, you taught others to break my commandment. Can I tell you the most serious thing I believe is coming here is because you and I, by our actions and articulations, teach people to disobey God. Amen. I'm glad you're here today. hope you are too. If you break the law and teach others to break it, you shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Or you can keep them and be called great in the kingdom of God. Expectation, accountability have always been tenets and doctrines of Bible faith. It's just recently in the New Age movement and the neo-evangelical movement that we've decided to throw away God's expectations. And decide to say that God is a God of love and, and, and you're free and you got liberty and you can do whatever you want to do. And that's not a biblical principle. It's not a biblical teaching. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Now, wherever you got that stuff, you didn't get it from the Bible. Amen. You got it from some Dr. So so somewhere. Amen. Dr. Howes used to say DD means diddly dumb. Ph.D. means fiddly D. Look, I don't care how smart they are. I don't care if they got a doctor. Look, I had a doctor taught me at, at Bethany College. He was a minister, a doctor of the Lutheran Church. And I'm not this in the Lutheran Church, but he was a doctor. Of the, and you know what? He, 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 he brought the Playboy magazines in and showed boys what, what play, page look at. He was doing sexual uh, experiments in the church, and he taught that man is only body and soul and no spirit. So he did his doctoral thesis on well, the guy was absolutely in contradiction to the Scripture. It's because he had doctor didn't mean he was, tell, was telling the truth. Amen? I'm just trying to tell you something, folks. Listen to me. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I believe that every word of that book is inspired by God, and every book of that word of that book is true, and every commandment of God is pure and sure and righteous altogether. And the person who will keep those commandments will be blessed, and the person who doesn't keep those commandments cannot expect God to be pleased with them. And it doesn't mean He doesn't love us. It, by the way, He is so gracious and so merciful and so long-suffering. Uh, you're looking at a guy right here that doesn't live a very good Christian. You're looking at a guy right here that breaks God's commandments more than I should. Amen? And it's God's mercy that 
keeps God blessing me. And can I tell you something? God said he'd curse the Jews, but how many millenniums did he let them disobey his word before he brought the cursing? He is long-serving. We got this idea because the hammer hasn't fallen on me. God must be okay. No, God's not okay with my disobedience. God's not okay with me living and believing the way I want to. He's just long-suffering and merciful. Thank God, amen? Well, listen to me. I'm trying to help you. That doesn't justify our disobedience. Because nothing's happened, we think we're justified. Oh, R.G. Lee preached a sermon payday someday. I like what one preacher said, God doesn't always pray on Fridays. We got this idea because, well, I made this decision and I know it's contrary to what God wants and I went and did it and nothing's happened to me, so it must be okay. It's not okay. And it might not be till you get to the kingdom of heaven when you'll find out that you're going to hear the words, least. Instead of hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you'll hear thou wicked and slothful servant. And not a mean bone in my body today, and I hope you don't think I'm mean. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's time for Christians to start keeping all the commandments. Time for us to choose to be all Christians, not some Christians. Amen. Amen. Listen, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, Christianity is not a smorgasbord religion. We're, we're, it's not a smorgasbord religion. Don't let anybody deceive you into believing that I have destroyed the law, Jesus said, or I have destroyed the keeping of it. I warn you that if you break one of the least of these commandments, if you teach others to break them, one of these least commandments. Listen, as humans, we decide to pick and choose. As humans, we try to justify our choices to God. As humans, we try to make trade-offs and bargains with God. You do things like this. Well, God, I know I didn't tithe, but I did go to church. As if going to church is going to make up for not tithing. And I, I know I didn't witness, but I, but I did give my tithe, as, as, as tithing is going to make up not witnessing. Amen? Uh, it's just, I'm, just, I'm just showing you how human humanity is. I'm just showing you the battle. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15 with me. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul tried this tactic with God. God, God said to Saul, I want you to go kill all the Amalekites. I want you to kill everybody, all the, all the men, all the women, all the children, the kings, everybody. And I want you to kill all the animals. I don't want you to spare any of them. And, I, you know, that's pretty vicious, isn't it? And I know there's a lot of people that say, well, that God is a, a wicked God for doing that. Well, God has, has to judge sinfulness. And a nation deserves to be destroyed. God has to do it. Amen. And Amalekites deserved to be destroyed, and he sent Saul to do that. Look at 1 Samuel 15, verse 19. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? You know the thing. Saul went and killed everybody except the king, and he kept the sheep and the cattle alive. And God sends Samuel to Saul and says, Saul has not obeyed me. And Samuel comes to Saul, and Saul says, why didn't you obey him? Samuel said, and he said, I did obey him. He said, well, what means the bleeding of the goat in my ear? You say you obey, but I hear the goats. You're supposed to kill those. Now look at verse 19. Wherefore, he says unto Saul, Samuel speaking, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. What a liar! But listen to me. I've been there. So have you. Well, Lord, I'm doing right. When we know we're not, we're trying to justify. We're trying to use a tactic on God that doesn't work, amen? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek. Uh-oh, cat's out of the bag. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people. But now, what? now, God, I did right. But you know what? Now, God, I need to do this. I know I'm in trouble now, so I'm going to blame it on the people. There's four things you can do with your sin. Let me give them to you from biblical principle. You can try to cover your sin, hide it. That's immediately what Adam and Eve did. Made coats to cover their nakedness. Hid in the garden. That's what David did with Bathsheba. Tried to hide it. You can hide your sin. You can blame somebody else for it. That's what Adam and Eve did. Adam said the woman. The woman said the, the, the devil. Hey, uh, you can... Uh, 
And you can, uh, the third thing you can do with your sin is uh, you can make excuses for it. Now, here's what Paul's gonna, uh, Saul's going to do. He's going to make an excuse for it. The people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. Watch it. To sacrifice unto the Lord. Well, wait a minute. I have an excuse. You see, we took these animals because we wanted to give you a sacrifice. We do that, don't we? Now, God, I didn't know what I did, but I had a really good intention. I really, God, I thought this would work out. God said, wait a minute, I didn't pay you to think. I paid you to obey. My dad used to say, I don't pay you to think, son. I pay you to obey. I've been in some positions, and they said to me, we didn't, we didn't hire you to think. We hired you to do your job. Now, they weren't me, and I shouldn't think about my job. They were about me trying to come in and run things and tell them how to do things when that wasn't my position. And a lot of us Christians try to tell God how to run things and do things. was not our position. Amen. The people brought them that we may sacrifice unto the Lord. You know what the fourth thing you can do with your sin is? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 28 and verse 13, it says this, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that, that confesseth and forsaketh it shall find mercy. Listen, there's not a person in here who could say to me this morning, I've kept all the commandments God gave me. I did everything this week I'm supposed to do. Not a one. It's not me, not you, not anybody. But you know, listen to me. It's wrong for us to try to make excuses, try to poo-poo it off, try to say it's no big deal. What we should be doing is getting on our face and confessing to God. God, I didn't pray. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't give my tithes. I didn't go to church. I didn't tell anybody about Jesus. I had evil. We should be confessing and then forsaking them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, if we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. But if we do not judge ourselves, we shall be chastened. That's what the Bible says. So here's my hope and my mercy as a Christian. When I recognize I've sinned against God and not kept His commandment, instead of trying to cover it, instead of trying to blame somebody else, trying to still try to make an excuse for it, I go to God and I say, God, I did wrong. I know I'm supposed to do this. And God, I ask you to forgive me. And God, as best I know how, I'm forsaking that and changing my way. That's called repentance. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about as a Christian, you and I want God's blessings. We cannot have God's blessings unless we're willing to keep His, obey, uh, His commandments. And because we're human beings and we fail, God gave us a wonderful process called confession and repentance so we don't get the judgment. Amen. Amen. And I'm one, that's a wonderful thing. But you and I need to understand how serious this matter is of keeping His commandments. Uh, 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 let me make this statement again, and I'll get to my point, and I'll be done. True Christianity is not a smorgasbord religion. Here's the title of my message this morning. Listen carefully. Be careful how you obey and teach. Be careful how you obey and teach. Can I tell you that every one of, in, of us in here is a teacher? Especially parents. Parents. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Little eyes are watching you. Little eyes are listen, little ears are listening to you. And you go out here and you do things contradictory to the Bible. They've heard it in Sunday school. They've heard it in the sermons. They know what's right. They know it's wrong. They're not ignorant. Can I give you my testimony? I left Christianity for over a year because all I saw was people disobeying what the preacher preached. I did it too. But here's what I said. I'm not going to act like I'm a great Christian and live like I'm not one. That doesn't justify me. Now, I'm telling you something. I watched people... And I know, don't watch people. I know these things are wrong, but I'm just telling you something. I'm trying to give you something to teach for yourself personally. I watch people. I watch them breaking what they knew they were supposed to do and acting like it's no big deal. We're teachers. I've got two questions I want to ask you. Number one, how completely are you obeying God's commands? 
How completely are you right now, today, this part in your life, how completely are you obeying God's command? Be honest about it. How completely? I'm not. I haven't shared the gospel with very many people recently. I got to share the gospel with Tara the other day. Is what a blessing it was. You know, I know I should be doing it. I know I ought to be out doing it. Brother Howard made a statement. We don't have a financial problem. We don't have an attendance problem. We have a soul winning problem. And he's right. Absolutely right. The church will never grow unless we go out and win folks to Christ and share the gospel and invite people to church. It ain't going to happen. It's the Lord's work. It takes work. Go ye, go ye, go ye. That's, you know, and I'm guilty. And I want to make excuses. I have cancer. I had surgery. I don't feel good. It's a long way to drive from Rose Hill to Wichita. I got things I need. I, I, got, the, I got the whole list of them. I, I can give you the whole list. The truth of the matter is I made a choice not to do it, and I have broken a commandment. And by the way, I'm teaching some other people not to do it too because people are watching me. Amen. Amen. If God states some ex expectation or principle one time in the Bible, it is His command and law. We as Baptists believe in a literal interpretation. If a command is clear, then it is clearly a command. And I can make all the excuses and I can argue about all I want to, but the truth of the matter is I'm in disobedience. Well, that, that going into all the world, that was given to the first disciples, only those 12. Give me a break. Come on. You know what we're trying to do? We're trying to justify Trying to make it look like we're not disobeying God's command. Well, I just believe Old Testament. I believe tithing's Old Testament. Give me a break. It's in the New Testament too. You can study it. Hebrews and other places. Amen. Jesus taught the Pharisees that they shouldn't quit tithing, but they ought to do grace and love and mercy. Those are more important. Amen. But still, tithing is a commandment, maybe a least commandment, but it's still required. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean. Hebrews 10:25. Not forsaking the assembly yourselves together. I'm not trying to be mean. That's a command in the Scripture. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to admit to you today that I'm guilty of not being obedient in so many areas. Number one, let me ask you again that question. How completely are you obeying God's commandments? Number two, this question. What is your life teaching others about obeying God's command? What is your life teaching others about obeying God's commandments? Who said, if you break it, and you teach others to break it. Can I tell you what? Many a time, as parents, we teach our children to break God's commandments. I'm not mad at you. Please, let God speak to your heart. Don't walk out of here with, 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 with anger. Realize, I'm trying to help you. I'm no better than you. <clears throat> I'm guilty. I said it, and I'll say it again. <clears throat> I'm the number one offender. But I am not going to lie about it. I'm not going to sweep it under the rug and act like it's not there. I want to be honest about it because honesty is the best policy if you want to get things right. I'm not saying that tomorrow I'll be perfect. I won't be. Like Paul, I've not arrived. And I will probably arrive till I get to heaven, amen. I'm going to try to do my best. But listen to me. What are you teaching? By your actions. By your actions. You want to know, I've said this before and I'll say this again. I grew up in a home where it was never a question if we're going to church three times a week. Never a question. And my mom and dad, we're going to church. We never discussion. Are we going to church tonight? We went to church three times a week. They taught me that being in church was. Then my pastor got up and said, "You ought to be in church every time the doors are open, unless you're providentially hindered." I'm not beating anybody up today. I just just an example I use. Okay. What are you teaching by your actions? Go to First Corinthians chapter ten very quickly. First Corinthians chapter ten. This principle is all through the Bible. What is your life teaching others about obeying God's commandments? How about what are you teaching by your actions? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Have you ever heard this statement? What parents do in moderation, children will do in excess. Did you know that generations tend to unrighteousness, not righteousness? You know that everything in this world tends to destruction and decay, not growth. And you know that if we, want, if we want our Christianity to continue, we cannot let decay become the law. 
We can't allow decay or the leaven to slip in because that's going to lead to more leaven and more leaven. And where we were once up here living where God wanted us to, we're now down here living in a way that doesn't even look Christian. And how did it happen? It happened like the frog who boiled to death one degree at a time. If I walked in here today and came across with some kind of weird, kind of crazy heresy, some kind of uh, a liberal, uh, ungodly doctrine, you would go, no, no, no. But if I just little by little start letting us move that way, we just quit doing little things. The little foxes spoil the vine. It's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. I'm an evangelist. Look, I'm telling you, I'm out here preaching, trying to keep churches from going backwards and start going back forward. That's what I've been called to do. And I'd be glad when you get a pastor so you can have a pastor instead of me in the pulpit. But that's just my heart. And I just believe that God's churches today are not seeing God's blessings because we've decided to pick and choose. And I am going to do what I want to do instead of what He wants me to do. And God says, I'd love to bless you. But I can't put my blessing on disobedience. You parents would be crazy to, to, to reward your children for disobeying. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all drink, uh, eat of the same spiritual meat and did all drink of the same spiritual drink uh, so they, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. They were saved. You understand when those Jews put that blood on the doorpost representing Christ? And the Passover land, they entered into salvation by faith. They put their faith in God's salvation. And they were saved people. That's what coming out of Egypt is, is salvation. They were saved people. And the New Testament tells us so. But what happened in verse number 5, but with, with what's the next word? Many of them, not a few, many of them, God was what? Not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Look at verse 6. Now these things were what? Our examples, New Testament Christian, to the end that we should not lost after evil things, as they also lost it. We'll not read the rest of it. Go and read it. And he says, we shouldn't have done like they did. They were examples. And God wasn't pleased with them, not because they weren't saved. They were saved. But they became unpleasing to God because they chose to disobey God's commandments. Amen. Amen. And those actions are supposed to be example to me. I'm supposed to learn from that. I'm not supposed to follow that path. Amen. But I see it today in Christianity. We're following that path. I don't like this, so I'm not going to do it. I don't like those lamb sacrifices, so I'm not taking my lamb there. And by the time you get to Malachi, God is condemning them really big time. Because they're divorcing their wives. Because they're despising the house of God not showing up. Because they don't bring their sacrifice. And when they do bring a sacrifice, they bring a lame lamb instead of a, a, a whole lamb. And they're robbing God of tithes and offerings. And so 400 years, He doesn't talk to them. Look, a New Testament principle here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8 with me very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. By your actions. Don't let your actions. What are your actions teaching? Look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man, what's the next word? See thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Question mark. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. He says, look, if you do something, somebody sees it, and it causes a stumbling block, causes them to sin, then you have been an example and you have done a sin yourself. Amen. Look what it says in verse number 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh. You know what he said? He said, I would rather not do something, even if it's legal, if it's going to cause somebody else to sin by my example, I'd rather not do it. For many years in my pastorate, I didn't have a Christmas tree. Are you against Christmas tree? I'm not. I don't believe they're idols. Now, if you worship one, I believe you should, you're in trouble. 
and we were idols. I had a man in my church that read in Jeremiah where they took a tree and they put gold and silver on it and they bowed down and worship. He said, that's what a Christmas tree is. So he expressed to me that he believed Christmas trees were idolatrous. Well, I don't care what he believes. Well, then I'm not a very good Christian. So I didn't have a Christmas tree. Why? Because I don't want to offend my brother. Well, you're wrong. I don't think so. Read the Bible. If my doing that's going to cause somebody to do a sin, cause them to sin, I'm not supposed to do it. What am I teaching with my actions? What are people seeing? And what's it emboldening in them to do? Do they see me uh, in, in, in some place where I shouldn't be? In, in some way I shouldn't be? Do they see me looking some way I shouldn't look? And does it embolden them to do something that they believe in their heart is not right? If Brother Houston, I know it's not right, but Brother Houston's doing it, so I'm going to do it. If Brother Houston can do it, I can do it. You know what I did? I just caused somebody to sin against their own conscience. Their convictions may not be in agreement with mine, but if they're the weaker, I'm supposed to bear their infirmity. I'm not supposed to put a stumbling block before the weak. If you're a mature Christian, you have a really high standard you need to live so that you don't influence young Christians to do something wrong. That's what God's teaching here. That's in His Word. Amen. Romans 14. 13 through 16 says, Let not therefore uh, judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. What am I doing as my actions? Am I causing somebody to sin because they see me do something, say something? Am I causing somebody to question the Word of God? What are we, what are we, what are we teaching by our actions? Number two, what are we teaching by our articulations? Listen, have you ever heard something said like this? Well, I don't see it that way. Ever heard those words? You ever heard these words? Well, I disagree. I don't think God's Word teaches that or says that, that I have to do that. You ever heard those words? Okay? I mean, that's a person expressing their opinion. That's a person using their choice. Amen? But listen to me. Those words, I think, are familiar. I think they were heard over there in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3, when Satan said, the Bible says he was more subtle, subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord gave. And here's what he said. And, and he said unto the woman, listen, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You know, when you and I sometimes we begin to question one of God's commandments and we speak that, we may be doing causing somebody to doubt God's word. Parents go home and they kill their kids because they have preacher for dinner. I don't mean they have him over for dinner. I mean, in front of their kids, they condemn the man of God. I've seen young people be destroyed because their parents criticize their youth pastor. He, pastor may be wrong, and a youth man may be wrong, but you don't, you don't articulate that in front of people. You go to them. Because when you articulate that in front of people, when you start questioning something that's in the Word of God, you're now teaching to somebody that God's Word really didn't say that. By articulations. What are we teaching? Let's go, let's go again to the example of Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking the sinners. Have you ever heard anybody say this? I don't think you have to go to church to be a Christian. Have heard anybody say that? How many of you heard somebody say that? It's quite common, isn't it? Can I tell you, in reality, it's true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But you know, when people make that statement, they're not trying to qualify Christianity. They're trying to qualify responsibility. What they're saying is, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church. You don't? Well, you better take Hebrews 10.25, cut out your Bible. You see what we are? We are Christians with pen knives. Are you listening to me? I'm trying to help you. Are you listening? We go through the Bible, and anything the Bible teaches that we don't like, we just basically cut it out of our Bible. We throw it over here in the trash can, so I don't believe in that. And by the way, we have the right to do that. The God-given right, you can do that. But I need to understand, and I'm trying to help you, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm trying to hurt you. I need to understand that my taking it out of the Bible doesn't change that it's in the Bible. And when I get to heaven, 
God said, you broke that commandment. And you taught your kids to do it too. And I'm sorry, but the only place I can say and put you is down here in the least category. I can't put you in the great category. I love you. Here's where I want to put you, in the great. But that's not up to me. That's up to you. For he that keepeth my commandments and teacheth them, he shall be called great. But he that breaketh one of the least of these my commandments, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Look, and I, I'm just an old narrow-minded. I'm a dinosaur. I think I've lived too long. I'm just old narrow-minded, Bible-believing Baptist. I know what that book says. I know what I believe. And I'm not planning on changing. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not perfect in my behavior at all. And I'm not perfect in anything. But I just simply know this. I know there are some things that we as Christians, we have decided that we don't like them anymore, so we are not going to do them. And we think that it's okay to be that way, but it's not okay to be that way. Now, I'm going to tell you, God loves you this morning. He loves you with all his heart. He's merciful and long-suffering. He is patient, but he is not tolerant. And there's two different things there. Be careful how you obey and how you teach. We got to be careful. Parents especially, you got to be careful. What do you want your children believing? I want my children believing the truth. I want my children to know what's right. I want them to know what the Word of God says. I want them to have no question. I know this is what God wants me. Now, if they choose to disobey that, and they do, and they will, that is not going to be my fault. I didn't teach him that. Amen. Thanks for being here. Let's stand with our heads bowed.